Uh, first off, I just want to thank you for everyone for coming. This is uh, you know, Prairie Hockey Academy's inaugural Bantam Prep Showcase Camp and we're just uh, so thrilled to have all the young men here and, and for the parents to come this way. We recognize you have lots of options and uh, so we don't take it lightly that you chose us. So appreciate appreciate that and appreciate you being here. My name is Justin Simpkins and I'm the president of Prairie Hockey Academy. And uh, this all started with a dream one day or an idea, I guess, and, and here we are. So it's, it's, uh, it's surreal, it's exciting. We're so excited as Prairie Hockey Academy to be partnering with Briarcrest College and uh, the Karenport High School and the, the high school side of Briarcrest College and, and seminary and these incredible facilities. Tonight we're gonna do a bit of an orientation. I'll tell you a little bit about how Prairie Hockey Academy started, why we're here, um, why we're really excited to be able to serve young men in this capacity and work in this game that we all love. And, uh, and then we're gonna hear from AJ Crocker and Karenport High School and hear a little bit about the high school that we you know, get to be um, enrolled in and get to be a part of their high school and student life and, and what it would mean to be a student at Prairie Hockey Academy here at the campus and and then we'll hear a little bit more from Ernie Wooters and Seven Edge Success and Ernie's actually our leadership coach and we use a lot of the Seven Edge material for all of our leadership development curriculum here uh, with Prairie Hockey Academy. So really excited to have Ernie here. He's gonna talk a little bit more about how we build what we call life champions. And so really quickly, there's a whole group of people here in this room that have helped put this event together and are, are involved and I just want to quickly introduce them because I think, you know, it's not Justin and it's not just Karenport High School, it's, there's, there's, a, there's a large group of people. If you come in and you're, you know, you play at Prairie Hockey Academy this year as, as a student athlete, it won't just be me and it won't just be your head coach to look after you. Um, you might have as much as 10 uh, men and coaches and mentors and people that come around you, so probably one for every two kids really and it's pretty fascinating. So Ernie Wooters is our leadership coach here in the front row from Seven Edge Success. Right behind Ernie we have uh, Eric Robitaille. Eric's a guest coach uh, with us here. He'll be around lots I'm sure at the academy. Graduate here of the college as a defenseman and defenseman of the year and ACAC and that. Steve Robitaille is actually the chair of the business program here at Briarcrest College and again guest coach this weekend. Rodney McPhee guest coach here this weekend as well. Uh, Rodney Rodney and I are good friends, go back a long time. He coaches down AA in Saskatchewan here. I missed a few people last time, so I apologize. I'm going to do it again. I have Taylor Rapp. Uh, he's a guest coach with us as well and guest cameraman today. Really, really excited to have him. Best looking camera guy. Uh, we have Ellery Pullman in the back. Ellery is actually a VP here at the school at Briarcrest College, and so thank you for coming, Ellery. AJ Crocker, you're going to hear from, Director of Enrollment. Uh, Mike and Carlene Benelic, you might have met them at registration table, so we're really excited to have them involved in the hockey program and their roots run deep. We can talk about that another time. Richard Clock uh, is back there. Uh, Richard's actually my father-in-law and helps out a lot on some of the administrative side and what we do here. Randy Voth, Randy, uh, longtime hockey dad. Uh, his dad, you know, his son is actually Blake Voth, or Voth, sorry, and uh, Blake's one of our goalie coaches here and will be out with, with the boys um, on Saturday morning. And then Scott Sipkins is my dad, and Scott's uh, part of our advisory board and, and helps uh, actually planning our golf tournament for fundraising for our scholarship opportunities coming up this year. I might have had everyone, I'm sure I missed a couple, but uh, there's lots of help. Uh, both Tessa and, and Jory in the back as well are part of the student uh, recruitment team and will be taking us through our campus tours tomorrow. And he'll get to meet them some, some more then too. So. There's a lot of us here involved. There's a few of us that aren't even here that'll be on the ice tomorrow with the boys and uh, throughout, uh, throughout the day and helping our strength and conditioning coach. Uh, we'll be here running the boys through some fitness testing and that sort of thing. And so there'll be, a, there'll be a handful more that you get to meet here over the next two days. I know I said fitness testing. I saw a couple of you guys kind of perk up a little bit. You mustn't have read the schedule. <laughs> so uh, it'll be good. It's not too, nothing too tough, just a, a fun little jog. So, real quick, you know, Prairie Hockey Academy is something that, uh, you know, is, for me personally, it, it's been, a, been something that I've been dreaming about doing and working on and uh, just kind of happened a little bit. Uh, for about nine years now, it's been something that I've, I've thought of, how do, we, how do we use the sport of hockey to develop young men who, uh, you know, make a difference in their community, go out and passionately affect change and, and lead, take responsibility. How do we develop young men who are life champions? 
that are actually thermostats. When they walk into a room, they can affect change. They're not, they're not young men who are so affected by our culture today that they easily buy lies and they easily fall victim to some of the things that society tells us are the way to go. And so we started a, a kids hockey program a, a number of years ago to, to try and do something like this. And I'll kind of tell you a story of how we got there, I guess. For myself, um, I, similar to you guys here at one point in time, looking at you know going into my second year of Bantam and this, this talk of the, the Bantam draft and different things and all these pressures, and I had an opportunity to play some hockey, and I, you know, I played different levels of hockey, some some midget and some junior and different things. And uh, as an 18-year-old, I actually, you know, made a Western Hockey League team, and had the opportunity right out of right out of the main camp with the Regina Pats that year to make a decision that day. And head coach said, Justin, this is your opportunity. We'd keep you on the team as a defenseman this year, or of course. As many of you might already be aware of, you can choose to go to the college route, right, junior A, and hopefully find a college scholarship. So I had, a, for me, my goal at the time was college hockey. I wanted to see a way, how could I use my sport to help get a college scholarship? How could I use my sport to get my education? And so I made a choice that day not to play in the Western Hockey League, but go chase junior A. I think the, the one key piece about this is as a young man growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of mentors around me. So I'm, eight, I'm 18 years old, I'm graduating high school at this time, and I'm fairly confident in myself to the point of fairly arrogant, um, very egotistical, and, and pretty sure that uh, you know nothing could really stop me. And so here I am as an 18-year-old now going down the road to a small town in Swan River, Manitoba to, to play my junior A hockey and uh, get two games into it and find myself with a uh, you know, pretty freak accident, pretty bad injury that would keep me um, hampered up for about eight weeks in recovery. So you don't realize as a young man, as a hockey player, that you think everything's going your way and you're playing, you know, you've made a Western Hockey League club, you've chosen not to, you're kind of choosing your own destiny, you're going down this road and all of a sudden this in incident happens that lays you flat on your back and you lose your whole identity of what you thought was your identity, hockey, right? So remember my girlfriend I had? Well, don't have my girlfriend anymore because she's not really interested in hanging out with the guy that's no longer running the power play and just kind of hanging out watching TV. So there's all these things that just come crashing down on you and if you don't, if your ego is so big, it's, it shatters really easy when you fall. And so no one ever told me at that point that my ego was actually going to be my enemy and was gonna hold me away from being able to rebound when these tough, tough events in life happen. So I went through life a little bit. I, I rehabbed for eight weeks. I was still pretty sure where I was going and who I was and until my coach called me and said, hey, Justin, how are you doing? And you know, you kind of say what you want to say. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready to come back, coach. I'm good to go. Good, I, I think I'm good. And he says, great. I'm gonna send you to Assiniboy. There's a junior B team there. I know the coach pretty well. You can go down there and rehab for the, you know, well, at least till Christmas and maybe longer, we'll see. <laughs> well, are you kidding? I just pulled a Western Hockey League team I wasn't gonna play for him so I come play for you and now you want me to go play Junior B? I'm not gonna report. So, it's, uh, it's an old thing to say and I'll tell you that it was one of my first choices that would create a lot of challenges for me for the next number of years in my life. And um, Junior Hockey is not really kind to kids that are pretty arrogant if you're not named Connor McDavid and I only know one name, kid named Connor McDavid and um, when you uh, when you haven't done a whole lot for them lately and you're 18 there's a lot of 18 year olds out there playing hockey and so if you don't want to go play junior B hockey that's fine probably good luck playing hockey anywhere and I didn't play hockey anywhere for the next three and a half years so I came to a crossroad at that point in time and I had to start making some different decisions because I got myself into some bad spots and so what I'm trying to say is at this point in time, I still wanted a college career and I had to make a choice, what am I gonna do with my life today? I've got myself here based on a lot of choices and I still wanna play hockey. So I'm 21 years old and I decide I wanna play hockey. I've now basically have wasted all my junior hockey years. I can no longer play junior hockey. So I decide to try and get in shape and I work out for about 10 months and about four hours a day and walk on to an NCAA school, a small division three college and end up getting a scholarship there and uh, make that team and still get to play some college hockey. Fantastic. I'm still not without an ego. 
even after all that, surprisingly enough. Lucky for me, at that point in time, I met a man, and his name was Jay Thorson, and he was director of development at the, high, or at the college in Minnesota. And he kind of took me under his wings and just saw me one day and knew that I was a freshman hockey player from Canada and started to build into me. Asked me good questions, asked me if I wanted to be a part of this book club that they were doing, asked me what I'd like to do when I grow up. Asked me questions like, you know, if we were to write your obituary today, what would it say, Justin? These kinds of things, hard questions that you started had to, you had to kind of think about now. It wasn't about, you know, who am I and I'm number four on the hockey team, actually, Jay. You should probably know that. Number one in your heart, four in your program, right? Kind of guy. So these kinds of questions and, and built into me a bit. At that point in time, I started to read books with Jay and, and recognize that I had this hunger for leadership. I ended up transferring up. After a couple of years, uh, I landed here at Briarcrest College and finished the rest of my hockey career off here and uh, was one of the captains of our team going into our fifth year. So I'm now in my fifth year of college hockey and I'm a captain on the team and we've got a pretty strong club and we um, are in playoffs and, and should be at a point where honestly we should be going to the, the championship that year. Our, our club was that strong. The tough part, we had a bunch of individuals. We didn't have leaders. And uh, as a captain on that team, I can tell you that I was probably one of the biggest individuals on that team. I still didn't have anybody that was teaching me what it meant to be a leader and how leadership is, in its most simplest definition, is about taking responsibility. And I see a lot of familiar faces here in the crowd because you guys have been a part of our program with Crusaders Hockey and that, and have learned a lot of this stuff. And the simple definition for me is somebody who takes responsibility and if you, if you take responsibility where you are, and, and leadership is not about a title, it's not about a position, it's actually about a choice that you make to put Hunter, somebody else's well-being, Connor's, but putting their well-being over and above your own. And uh, making your teammates better. When I was playing college here, going into playoffs, it was still about me. That was the fascinating part about life. Uh, when I look back at it here and I'm going, I never once put my teammates actually above myself, even in that final year. And um, upon graduating, I actually had the chance to meet Ernie, and we were I was helping coach the college team. And Ernie came in as a as a leadership consultant with with this material and said, "This is actually how we develop leaders." And for the first time in my life, I'd seen all these books I read, but I'd never had anyone come beside me and go, "Well, this is actually the path to get you from point A to point B." And I looked at it and I said, "Well, could you?" I actually looked at my coach, who I was one of his captains the year before, and I said, Calvin, I just want to first off just apologize uh, for my arrogance, my individual practice, not being a leader and uh, not helping our team succeed last year on, on and off the ice. Um, if we would have had this, I, I think we might have won the championship last year. If we could have been as a cohesive team pulling in one direction, it would have, it would have been blown away. So at that point in time, I thought, you know, imagine if I could have had this as a 12-year-old. Would it change my, would it change my trajectory? It would at least would have given me the tools to make decisions on how I want to go and where I want to go. And um, that's why we started kids hockey programs. As we started to develop young men through our through our kids hockey programs, we got countless letters from parents, teachers, teachers writing emails to parents saying, "I don't know what happened to Jackson, but all of a sudden." We've been working on him all year. He's been a distraction. But all of a sudden, Jackson just decided to start sitting in the front row. Jackson decided to start helping out. Jackson decided to start being a leader in class. I actually noticed Jackson helping out the guys that normally sit by themselves in the schoolyard, um, going alongside of them. And he's making a difference in our classroom every single day. So I don't know what you guys did to Jackson, but this is awesome. So the parent forwards that email to actually was Rodney, was the coach, said, we didn't do anything. Um, he's been a part of your hockey program for three weeks. And I'm going, we actually didn't do a whole lot either. Jackson did. We actually said, hey, Jackson, if you would like to be a leader, it's pretty fascinating. We stand here, and if I asked you guys today how many of you are leaders, uh, you don't have to tell me now. I should have asked at the beginning, but probably 20% of you might think that you are, and the other 80 wouldn't. And the truth is you all are if you choose to be. And when we told Jackson that, it gave him the opportunity to turn around and make a decision to be a leader, and he started making a change. And, and Jackson today is playing midget AAA hockey and making a difference, and the captain on his midget AA team before that, and so on and so on and so on. Um, we've, we've done a recent study just to run some numbers of the boys that we got to coach over the last five years, and 
you know, between our 99 and our 2000 age group, about 80% of them are playing midget AAA hockey, Western Hockey League or Junior A this year, or this past season that just passed. And out of all those kids that are playing, it was about 50 or 60, I'm trying to remember the number now, that are either wearing an assistant captain or a captaincy. It's a very large percentage, because I mean, about 12% or 15% of the kids on your team actually wear captaincies or assistant captains. Um, and again, it's nothing we did spectacular. It's just, if you understand that you have the opportunity to be a leader and to make a difference, you can start making choices based on that. And we've got an incredible program that will guide you from point A to point B. That's why we started Prairie Hockey Academy. We've seen incredible fruit from some of the work we've done. And I just look at it today, if we don't start intentionally developing leaders, we're in a whole heap of trouble in this next generation. And so that's why we're pretty passionate about doing what we do here at Prairie Hockey Academy, and that is we develop life champions. And not only life champions that just kind of arrive and win championships, but life champions that decide to make their teammates better every single day and lead and um, develop others. So that's kind of a short little story into what we're doing. For us, uh, Prairie Hockey Academy, we, you know, it's a bit of a longer purpose, I guess, but we want to provide an opportunity for like-minded, elite-level hockey players. And we want to provide that opportunity for you guys to develop life skills and hockey skills, both on and off the ice. And we want to focus on academic and athletic success. And so it's not just hockey. You're going to be student first, then athlete. But we're going to provide an opportunity that you get to develop both at an incredibly high level. Good. So visions that we have is to foster character development in each student athlete during his time on campus. We want to focus on the areas of wise decision making for you guys. Understanding how do you make a tough decision? What does that look like? Right? I mean, you're going into high school. So how do you make a tough decision? If you're here away from you know, family and you get to live in the dorms, you get to be young men. You get to make decisions every day. So how do we, how do we focus on making wise decisions? The things that we can control, things like your work ethic, the effort you put into things, your gratitude. What does it mean to have a growth mindset? We want to focus on those. Yeah, that each student athlete fosters this growth mindset I just spoke about. And we're going to talk about that some more tomorrow in our classroom session. We'll talk about what does a growth mindset look like and how do you foster that. The whole idea here is that a growth mindset understands that you can develop any skill and maximize your own potential. There's kind of two beliefs. You either believe that you're born a skill or you believe that skills developed. We're going to zoom in on those two beliefs and figure out which one's which and where are you guys at. Right? We want a vision, we have a vision that each student athlete learns to embrace failure. Again, this is coming back to growth mindset. If we embrace failure, we're not focused on the outcome every day. We're actually focused on the process. And if we can embrace failure and understand that failure is actually the only way that we learn. I have a two and a half year old daughter at home and I've never seen somebody learn that quickly. It's my first daughter, right? Incredible, but they fall and 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 they, fall and they don't care as they haven't been told yet that they should be worried what somebody else thinks about them. They just get up and keep going. Uh, we have a vision that each student athlete learns how to practice and that they develop skills that are effective and attractive to the next level of competition. I'm going to guess the majority of you guys, you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't because you really passionately love the game of hockey and you would like to see yourself go as far as you can go. We're going to help you get there. Yeah, there we go. Financial opportunities that are created through scholarships. You know, if we have a high academic standard here and we help you with your SATs and we focus on the student aspect first, you're going to get an incredible opportunity to use your sport to help you go through your education, give you incredible experiences in life, and there's nothing like it. Um, my five years of college hockey, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade for anything. It was so much fun. Camaraderie you can build with your teammates, being able to travel and do school together every single day something that uh, I'm a little bit envious that you guys will have the opportunity to do at high school and then into college. So pretty cool that way. Of course, hockey development. You know, players that attend Prairie Hockey Academy, you guys will have an edge um, on any of your peers locally when it comes to development time. There, there will be nobody else in this province that practices as much as you. There will be nobody else in this province that does as much off-ice training as you. And I would wonder how many of you guys would even do, you know, what is it, 170? 150 to 180 hours of study hall. 
in a year, right? So every single night, or every single day, I should say, we should start with that. Life as a Prairie Hockey Academy student athlete means that through your high school class day, so when you go to class between, let's just call it 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., when you show up and go to school, one of your class periods, 75 minutes long, is actually an on-ice practice with your team. It's practice. You get to go for practice. Kind of instead of phys ed class, right? Pretty fun. Another one of your classes is a 75-minute off-ice class. It's going to be where you're going to have the opportunity to maybe hear from Ernie. Maybe we have a nutritionist in. Maybe our strength and conditioning coach is here. Um, possibly we have some mental training coaches. There's different things like that that we're going to bring in here. You might have a yoga coach for a day. Those types of things we get to do in that off-ice training period every day. And then in the evening, we're actually not driving to Melville for a game at 7 p.m. We're, we're done for the day. The evening's about our studies. It's about going to the cafeteria, getting a good supper in us, doing some studies. Maybe we get to go watch the basketball game or the volleyball game, enjoy student life here at Karenport High School, and then study hall between 7.30 and 8.30. Get our work done, and away we go, right? So then we can actually focus on when we go on the road for weekends to big showcase tournaments, we can do that. And I know Hunter and I were talking about this at the beginning, that the amount of development time, upwards of 200 hours of on-ice practice, that doesn't even include your games. 200 hours of practice. I mean, if you were playing Bantam AA this past year in Saskatchewan, you probably had, I think an average is about 30 from the teams that we've talked to, but call it 30 to 40 hours of practice this year. Right? Probably two practices a week, about an hour long. Be, you ran anywhere between a 15 to 20 week season, so about 30 to 40 hours of practice time. We're going to have 200 hours here. Um, you're going to have your professional coaches. We'll have a player development coach that's here. All that kind of stuff. So power skating coaches will be coming on the ice, strength and conditioning coaches. So it's pretty fascinating. I think the opportunity is incredible. We're going to worry about the, the person first, and then from there, the studies, and then from there, Athletics will come and hockey will come, and we're all passionate about hockey, so I'm really not concerned about hockey right now. Um, but that's basically it. I think, I think for me and a, and a passion in my life is I just I don't want to try and constantly be fixing 25-year-old men. I really want to develop and train 15-year-old men so that young men like yourselves, that you guys are ready to go into life when it hits you and it hits you fast. You know how to make tough decisions. You know what you stand on. You know what your purpose is. You know what you want for the future, and um, you don't have to waver. So that's kind of it for me for now. I'm going to ask AJ Crocker to jump up here and talk a little bit about Karenport High School for us, and and uh, go from there. Awesome. Thank you. My name is uh, AJ, and uh, usually when I go speak at camps, we play guess my name. We won't do that today. But the second game we usually play is guess my weight. We won't play that either. <clears throat> but my hair is naturally curly, and uh, and my wife teaches in the high school, so it's a it's a double whammy when I get to meet you in a, in in your onboarding process and the recruitment process, and then my wife gets to grade your English papers. It's actually uh, fun back and forth at her, and I get to get to have. I uh, came here uh, for, in grade nine. In grade eight, I uh, ran into a few issues in my life, uh, a couple suspensions, a couple uh, uh, drive homes from the policeman, and uh, and my parents uh, thought, you know what, this this might be time for a change, and and uh, they they weren't thinking about Karenport, but one thing that I recognized in the, in the midst of that was that I would. Uh, I would have loved in grade eight to have played hockey with Christian dudes. I would have loved to play hockey with, with guys who actually kind of valued the same things that I did and, and wanted to be the t same type of person uh, that I was hoping to be as I had learned my lessons through grade eight. And, uh, and so grade nine, I chose to come out here. We lived in Moose Jaw and uh, we decided to, to start driving out and, and, uh, and jumped here. I, I, I made that call for, for a couple of different reasons, not just because the locker room and not just because I wanted to play hockey with Christian guys, but I actually wanted a place where where I was surrounded by people who were going to help me figure out what being Christian was, help me figure out uh, why this was important and and why the why the Bible mattered, and I was kind of I was kind of sick at at all times saying no to my social life if I didn't want to drink, or I was sick of going to my buddies' houses and uh, and being offered pot every time I'd go, and uh, and I just wanted I wanted to meet some dudes and and go to school with people that were uh, were more like me and had similar values uh, to me. I also heard the girls were way cuter in Karenport, and uh, and so that was that kind of was was the clinch. Sure, that's a joke. You guys can laugh. 
at that one. It's not a joke, actually. The girls are cuter here. I, that's actually in our promotional material. I think we, I think we promised that. I'm just joking. And it's not. But what, what I found, when I got here, what I found uh, was more than just guys my age who, who didn't drink all the time. I actually found guys who, uh, who went to church, who, who went to youth group when we weren't playing, who, uh, who were at a school that, uh, that was providing some of these opportunities. I found teachers that cared about me, who, about who I was, about who I was becoming, about why I was joking around the way I was, um, about, about identifying some of the things that, that Justin mentioned that his coach down uh, in, in Minnesota uh, started asking him, started asking me, AJ, why, why is it that you think that's funny, actually, because that's, that's, uh, that's not great in the classroom, that's not great to the people around you, and started actually shaping me. Uh, and putting me on a path that, uh, that helped me be a bit more helpful and a little less uh, distracting, my teachers would say. Um, I found, I found a, a place where teachers and coaches uh, and friends uh, were prioritizing uh, who I was going to become and not just uh, getting me through or putting up with me. And, uh, and that was, that was a, a deal changer, a life changer for me. And, uh, and to this day, uh, this, this high school really did, really did change to the point that my wife and I uh, are just thrilled to be here and be able to invest uh, back in. The last seven years, uh, I served as our, uh, as our chaplain. We have a, a position here in the high school. It's, it's uh, similar to a hockey chaplain, except uh, it's more, more like a youth pastor would be. So we've got a, we've got a guy here uh, who who's in, in the role now named Caleb, and he has an office in the high school hallway right by the boxes, and, uh, and he's, that door is open all the time. He's full-time focused on, on helping, uh, helping our high school students figure out uh, some of these tough questions that are where it's kind of hard to find a place to ask, things that you don't want to ask your parents uh, about, and, uh, and a guy who, who played, luckily for us, for this group, a guy who played hockey his whole life, played double-A through Regina, played our, clip, our, uh, our Briarcrest program here for five, or four years, I do believe, and, uh, and, and is just very excited about this. Uh, about this partnership we have with Prairie Hockey Academy. Uh, on top of that, we of course have our dorm program that has youth pastors overseeing that. We've got college students. We've got three schools here, high school, college, and seminary. So we've got college students living in the dorms and college students helping out of like, like we've got here represented on the, our PHA staff. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got college students all over the place deciding to give up of their time to pour into our high school students and the layers of relationship, the layers of mentoring then uh, extend well past the ice. They extend into the class, into the social uh, life, into the, the, the events that are happening. My wife right now is running an event called Taco de Mayo because I couldn't quite book it on the 5th of May. So instead of May the 4th uh, event, they call it Taco de Mayo. They're just doing Taco in a bag. They're watching, they're watching a movie and this is just a, a youth group event that our school gets to do. And one of the things that's beautiful about this place is that we actually do kind of get to run the school like a youth group. And the, the hockey players I know don't typically get to go to youth group because practice and, and games are typically right in the middle and those, those pesky youth groups won't, won't plan their schedules around our hockey schedules and then it's, it's actually pretty hard. And what's beautiful about Cannonport High School is that we have sports at a high level and all, across the board and as we merge hockey back into our culture, uh, we actually get to run our school like a like 150 person senior high youth group. And we get, to, we get to prioritize excellence in sports and excellence in academics and excellence in, in discipleship or in, in figuring out what following Jesus looks like uh, all together. And we get to do that in, in some pretty big numbers. Uh, you got one of these in your package. And so in, the, in that package, you've got a, hand, a couple different sheets. Uh, this thing will give you a much, a much uh, more official look at, at, at who we are as Cannonport High School. And uh, I'll just walk you through a couple things here. Uh, that the, these are the five categories that we have in this book. So when we say holistic growth, we really do mean that we, we want to be developing people in their heart, their soul, and their mind. And as Jesus talked about that through the Gospels, he, did, he, he wasn't just concerned that you, that you ask forgiveness for your sins and you keep going. He actually was, was focused on you shaping your mind, shaping your, your, your body, shaping your soul, and, uh, and, and prioritizing that. So we have, option, we have opportunities for our students to be developed in all, all of these ways. Uh, what's really cool, uh, and and knowing this because I'm married to a staff member, uh, is that our, our teaching staff is, is, is a lot more actually here than, than just a science teacher and just a, a math teacher, that, that these are people who are invested in our community, in, in, our, in our school that have been here for quite a while, who aren't on the verge of retirement, which is handy too. They are actually caring about, about your heart, your soul, your, your mind, and, and so we get to, we get to take the, or prioritize a more holistic look at, at development. Um, 
the personal development piece, uh, really, we're, we're really ho uh, focused on helping you become the person that, that you want to be, that, that we have opportunities here that you can develop. It's a little bit different, actually, when you live in a, in a school that's dorm-based, that has a, a culture around the whole day, uh, because then, actually, you, you do get to grow up a bit faster. You, you're, a little bit for, you're a little bit more separated from your parents a little bit, whether you're in dorm or not. There's just a lot more autonomy and independence allowed in a tiny little campus like this. And, uh, and, and there's ways in which the school's uh, structured so that we can be developing people in a bit more uh, in, in the ways that you want to be developed and, and in the ways that, uh, that you want to pursue. Um, we've got plenty of opportunities uh, there. The educational encouragement piece, um, I'll just do this. I'm not a principal. Our principals are both... Uh, coaching elsewhere. So one baseball, one volleyball at, at nationals with our Briarcrest 18 team. Uh, but uh, let, me, let me show you this. In, in educational uh, realm, I'm just going to turn this so I can, I can hit all the points here. Uh, I, this school has the best of private and the best of public. This is actually an ideal situation. So we are a fully accredited uh, Prairie South school. You will graduate uh, and you'll take credits away from Carnival High School that are, gover that are the government. It is government curriculum. Uh, what we do hold is the ability to hire Christian teachers. We're able to hire by faith based. And we're able to run a discipleship program within that. So we get to run a Christian ethics program and a chapel program within the school day. So period three every day uh, is uh, this right now. This term is chapel or Christian ethics. So you're either in class working on, on topical work with your, with your teacher or you're in or you're in. Uh, you're in chapel with our chaplain, who I mentioned earlier, uh, digging into the Bible, worship, doing prayer, prayer chapels, uh, working on some of those sp spiritual disciplines, which is beautiful. Uh, all of that in the midst of... A, a public school. There's no, there's no weird credits coming out of Cambridge High School. It's a normal, normal diploma. It is really the best of both worlds in a public and private situation. Our 442 semester system is a bit strange, but this actually enables a number of things. So in the first semester, we, we're only doing four classes um, technically at a time, and uh, that means that we're done uh, by Christmas. So we're not, we're not going away on Christmas, coming back, trying to remember what we learned, and then two weeks later writing finals. We're just chopping off that semester, the end and middle of December, and going on to Christmas, guilt-free and re able, to, able to enjoy. Unless you've got tournaments, then you've still got to be working out. You know what I mean? I don't know how, the, I don't know how late these tournaments go. Uh, but the semesters end. And then in January, we start back up. We do four more classes at that point, and that ends, ends right before, uh, right, usually right around Easter, right around Easter break. Uh, so today was the first uh, day of our term three. And term three is just two classes a day. One all morning with a, a break in the middle and one all afternoon with a break in the middle. And this means our students are able uh, to, take, uh, to take an intensive uh, look at, at two subjects. Uh, if you take one spare, of course, in the third term, you've got... Uh, you've, you've got a half day off. I'm not sure if that's allowed for, a, for a, an athlete in, in PHA, but it was good for me. There was not such rules on me. Uh, the six period day uh, gives a lot of flexibility. That's highlighted in your, uh, in your uh, breakdown of your day as, as an athlete uh, with, uh, with PHA. And uh, I already highlighted Chapel Christian Ethics. Academic accountability. Um, you, we've got a number, of, a number of pieces here. Our teachers are, are always reporting back. We've got a good accountability system with our principals. Our principals are both huge. They're big, just big dudes. Derek, if you look online, he's in this, uh, he's right here. He looks like Goldberg from WWE. He's like, his neck is bigger than my head, and my head is huge. And uh, he's an intimidating dude, and that's the dude you have to talk to when, you're, when your studies are out of whack. Shane, our other vice principal, is like, I don't know, 6'12", I don't know how tall he is, 6'5", six, six, anyway. He went, he was, went down south on a baseball scholarship, and that, that guy's a good athlete. I mean, he's old now, but he's a good athlete, right? And so these are, these are the guys that are helping us in our academics, helping keep, keep us accountable, and I think for, great, for hockey, hockey guys like yourself, uh, role models like that and academic coaches like that are actually really, really, really helpful. And they give us good role models, and they actually encourage us to be the best, uh, the best students that, that we can be. And uh, we're, we're so lucky to have those guys. Uh, in the dorm program, if you guys are looking at coming to the dorm program, this, all this stuff gets cranked way up. So all of a sudden, you've got structured study time in the dorm. You've got layers of college students just living in the dorm. They, they go through interview process, and then they're just in there as big brothers. We've got a, a leadership layer of RAs that are, that are uh, uh, leadership positions that college students um, apply into. And then we've got staff positions that are, uh, that are more youth pastor-like that are looking after. So you've got layers of people older than you pouring into you, ensuring this. And some of that means uh, some really good academic uh, accountability. Uh, the student support team, career counseling, and uh, the tutoring services. The fact that we are a much bigger institution than a 150-person high school means that we've got resources here that small schools actually don't, don't usually have. And we've got ac access to tutors who are in the midst of their, of their uh, college uh, career, and uh, we've got 
It is count, a, count, a full counseling center, actually, uh, here that is that is available to all three of our schools, which is a gift, which is a real gift to our uh, to our athletes and to our uh, to our students. Uh, communication is a priority for our uh, for our academic uh, uh, office, and uh, that that happens because a good chunk, almost 35% of our students, are living in dorm right now, and that means that uh, that we need to communicate with parents uh, at, at a premium level because a lot of our students are away from home. So communication ends up being a, a top priority for our principals, which is uh, which is just a value that's that's pretty standard here at, at CHS. Let me show you a day. This is a, what a day in the life of of yourself would look like. 8:30, you, uh, well, 8:30, 8:25 you'd get up, walk over to school. Uh, core class you'd have there. So you'd have a normal school class there. Uh, 9.50, uh, you've got cha uh, Christian Ethics or Chapel. Again, one of those, one or the other. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays, you're in class. Wednesdays and Fridays, we're in chapel. Sometimes in here with all the, ch all the college uh, and seminary, and sometimes, uh, most times, on our own, over in our own chapel. Um, on ice training, then after chapel. So right before lunch, you're jumping in on the ice, and, uh, and that's a great time of the day to be on the ice. Uh, you jump into lunch. That's a nice long lunch. I don't know if you're looking at that. That's an hour 20. That's a nice long lunch. I wish I had that long of a lunch now. Uh, right back after lunch, core class, back in the classroom, and then you end off your day while your brain's getting a little mushy from all this, all this physical work and learning. Uh, you get back out uh, into uh, into the off ice training. Uh, great, uh, again, a really great time to uh, to be to pr be pursuing that. Uh, meal times, uh, as you can see, you've got uh, you, it's mandatory. Beautiful thing, it's mandatory. Go to breakfast. Some of our dorms also operate with a hand in your phone at nighttime, uh, which you guys don't like, but your parents love that actually. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. Uh, you hand in your phone at nighttime, and then you get it back when you show up for breakfast. This does two things. One, it makes sure you eat breakfast, which is crucial. Uh, number two, though, it makes sure you sleep. And what we had, actually, when we impl implemented that rule was two weeks of just angry, angry teenagers. And then all of a sudden, we had really, really healthy teenagers for some reason, right? It was a mystery as to why all of a sudden they weren't sick all the time, and why they weren't fighting with everybody, and why they were showing up, like, ready to learn, things like this. So uh, we've, this is actually one of, one of the things that we're able to instill in people and, and, and focus on, kind of on that whole person development. Uh, weeknights, an hour of study hall, that's mandatory. If you've done your homework ahead of time, you didn't plan your day well because you got an hour to do homework at night time. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a good look at our educational encouragement. Let me just touch on two other things. One thing uh, is this. Uh, one of our pieces in here is a safe environment. Uh, this, is a, this is an incredibly safe town, actually. Uh, and, and not just because it's a bunch of, bunch of Christians and, and it comes off as a bit of a weird christian town at times. Uh, it, it's actually because it's a really caring community. And, and the other aspect of that is, is it's a dry town. And this actually is crucial for our students. Regardless of how much they love Jesus, uh, the availability of alcohol and, and, and drugs in our, in our culture is, is, is pretty, pretty rampant. And for me, when I was in grade 8 and grade 9 and grade 10 and all the way to college, it was really helpful that, it was that we actually had to sign a contract that said we weren't going to do that. that. There was an extra layer of accountability that actually saved me from myself, I think. And, uh, and so that's still what we do here. And, and you have to try pretty hard actually to find this stuff. And, and some of our students do, and there's mistakes made. And then you have to talk to Shane and Derek, our principals again. And I, like I said, those are huge dudes. You don't want to talk to them too often like that. Uh, so this is actually a really, a really safe environment for, for some, of this, uh, some of this kind of growing that, that we're looking for, which is, which is a beautiful thing. And lastly, is just the spiritual formation, which we would call uh, discipleship probably in a church, that, that, we, that we do really care about our students uh, wrestling with what it means to follow Jesus. And that we've got all of these youth pastors and this chapel programs and these Christian teachers and these dorm programs uh, and, and these, uh, these, these aspects of, of what it means to do youth ministry really, really well in the midst of an academic environment, uh, and and now getting to do that in the midst of, of what an excellent hockey program would look like too. This is absolutely your best option at playing hockey at, at an extremely high level and pursuing a faith that that might be uh, bigger than your, yourself, and, and and very well may end up being bigger than your hockey career. And uh, we would love, we would love the chance, the honor to to be a part of your life in these ways. And uh, and if you've got any questions on any of this stuff, um, I'll be I'll be available after after this session. Uh, Tessa, our enrollment officer for the high school, um, and Jory at the back. You might have seen them already. They'll be around. Feel free to come ask us about any of this. We would love to uh, discuss uh, that. I believe I am kicking it to Ernie uh, now. Is that is that correct? Awesome. Thank you, guys. I even got some laughs by the end of it, so thank you for being kind about that. Thanks, AJ. 
All right, well, great to see everyone here and privileged to be here with you all. <clears throat> uh, I get to finish us and bring us home, and so I'm excited to talk about what I'm passionate about, which happens to be what Justin's passionate about, which is why we hang out together. So uh, the question 30 years ago that I asked uh, was, is it possible to actually be intentional about developing leaders? Like, could I embark on a journey that could actually develop a program that could shape and mold the character of young leaders or leaders in general. Is it possible to do that? That was my question 30 years ago. And so um, I want to give a little bit of background. I'm going to let that sit for a bit and uh, give a little bit of background. I was fortunate to grow up on a farm in Ontario. And uh, we had, I was really privileged that on our acreage uh, in Ontario, we had our own hockey rink. So we were actually kind of the center of recreation in our community. We had our hockey rink, it was uh, boards, lights, heated shack, so I grew up with that. And on every field, we had the soccer field on another acreage, we had the baseball field on another. So we were kind of the community center where I grew up. So I grew up uh, in a large family that could actually field a hockey team, but the thing was is I had six sisters. So. Uh, they were all hockey players, and when we moved out west in 1975, there actually wasn't girls hockey in Medicine Hat. And so my family started girls hockey in Medicine Hat in 1975. So, long history of hockey, I love hockey. And just to give you, I'm probably going to give my age away a little bit, but uh, when I played Bantam All-Star, there wasn't a Bantam draft. So, <laughs> it's a while back. But anyway, uh, to talk about the last 30 years, so this, this topic of leadership became a passion of mine. I graduated from the University of Alberta in, with an engineering degree, and I soon became uh, very passionate about how do you develop leaders. And so after years of research and studying that, I want to give you just a few uh, highlights of what I've learned in the last 30 years. But I want to answer a question that many people ask, and, the, and you've probably heard this lots before, but are leaders born or are they made? Are leaders born or are they made? And of course we're all born, but statistically what I've discovered is about 12.5% of you have the actual natural gift of leadership. And so leaders, even if you're born with the gift, have to be trained. And so we're all developed. So leaders are developed. And what I found over the years is that there's not a lot of programs out there that are holistic in training. So they might talk about strategic, and they might talk about team, and they might talk about ethics, but they often don't talk about other parts of a person's life that are really, really important. And so that was one thing I discovered. It's not a holistic program. The other thing I, I realized over time was that most organizations don't want to pay for that. In fact, 80% of organizations today don't put any money into leadership development. Shocking, but they don't. The other thing I realized was um, leaders are extremely rare. And some of the enemies to developing leadership is what Justin talked about. Number one is ego. And so I've had a difficult time going into organizations because I always run into somebody that doesn't want to be exposed because they're not leading. And ego is one of the major enemies. The other enemies I've discovered is complacency. So we're being complacent with developing people or teams or organizations. Uh, the other thing I've realized is that uh, people, when it comes down to training, there's not only there a lack of it, but people don't want to pay for it either. And so the task of developing people is also sometimes overwhelming. People say, wow, that's so hard. I don't know if I want to put the effort into actually developing leaders. And so... A number of years ago, I had a defining moment uh, as I began to put a program together. I began looking for leaders, and I go into organizations knowing I'm bringing leadership training to them, but I was trying to see if I could find one within the organization. And I had the privilege about 17 years ago to be invited to uh, the University of Dundee in Scotland, and I, my task was to bring leadership development training to uh, world leaders, and these were world leaders to not companies, but to countries. So I'd, these were assistants to presidents of countries, and I thought, well, what could I possibly teach them? Uh, because that's a long time ago, and you can see I'm not that old, but I didn't really know. Uh, I, I thought I'd go into that uh, adventure and just see what would come of it. And one of the people that were uh, a leadership guru of the day was Warren Bennis, and he has consulted to five U.S. presidents. 
And so what did he think about the topic of leadership? And that was kind of my opening line as I spoke to these world leaders. And he said, here's the problem uh, today, is that the world is currently facing three extraordinary crises. Number one is the threat of nuclear disaster. Number two was the threat of illness and disease. And then number three, which you won't likely see a blockbuster movie made about it. You probably won't get the major headlines in a newspaper, but it's an ever-increasing leadership crisis. That was 17 years ago. And so since that time, we've just heard of people falling from the corporate America to local government to police chiefs to council members, and the list goes on. So we know that we're in a crisis. And... Uh, I remember my sister who invited me to this conference, an international lawyer, world renowned. Uh, it was my mom and dad's 50th wedding anniversary, and we were out for a canoe, uh, in a canoe ride. And I was discouraged. I'd spent five or six years after Scotland trying to develop leaders, and I'd go into organizations, and I would always run into a wall. I'd always run into another wall. And it was either ego or it was a number of reasons that I couldn't penetrate the lid. And I was discouraged by that, and I was talking about this with my sister, and it was at that defining moment that she said, uh, Ernie, quit looking for leaders. Why don't you become the leader? And why don't you develop leaders? And the switch went on. Yeah, I'm going to stop looking, and I'm going to start developing. And Justin has caught that. You know, 10 years ago when I was here with Justin, you know, look at what he's done. Is that He goes, Ernie, I get that. And I wish I would have had that. And so Justin's one of those rare people that wants to develop leaders, and that's why I'm here to support him, because this is really the crisis of the day. And one of the things I found out, which won't surprise you, is that the first 17 years of your life is what shapes your character and your behavior. And for the most part, that's what you live with after that. And I work with people of all ages, and it's, it's quite often I have to go back to those early years to help them to see the decisions that they made and try and help them overcome some of the mistakes that they made so that they can realign their life to a different set of behaviors. So coming at young leaders early on is a very, very positive thing. So early on I said, is it possible to come up with a strategy for developing leaders? And the answer is yes. And so here's a, I'm an engineer, and so... I like formulas and diagrams. And so here's the formula that I have. The right leader, I've got the right leader, and I have the right strategy. I believe I'll get the right results. So what am I looking for in a leader? And this right here, just to make it really simple, is I'm looking for a leader with the right heart. And basically today, it's really talking about the core values. So what am I looking for in a leader? I'm looking for core values. And as I've studied this topic of leadership and read all kinds of biographies and worked with thousands of people over time, these are the core values that I believe are the right values of a leader. And it's an acrostic that you will learn if you come here. It's called I Adapt when having healthy clarity and focus. And these become the 11 core values of a champion. Integrity, accountability, discipline, attitude, passion, teamwork, work ethic, honor, humility, being coachable, and fear less. That's the heart of a leader, and part of what Prairie Academy is, is this is what they believe. If we have the right leader, if we shape our young leaders to have the right values, this is what drives all of your decision making, is your values. And so, the right leader with the right strategy will get me to the right results. So, when I look at strategy, and this becomes a really important part, over the years, I've learned that there were some parts missing, and so I talked to you earlier about strategy. So strategy, we'll talk about why are we there, what's our purpose, what's our core values, what's our vision. You saw that laid out for Prairie Academy. So this really speaks about direction. So you need to know strategy. You also need to understand team. You also need to understand ethics, which is really about leaders, right? So a leadership side. 
And most leadership organizations will focus on these three, and so did I, going back 30 years ago. I started out in this direction, but quickly found that this actually wasn't that hard to come up with. But what really was hard was these other four areas that weren't being trained. So some will speak a little bit about mental. Very few will talk about the physical. In sports, of course, we do, but not in corporations. And then there's an emotional aspect. And lastly, a spiritual component. So I, I found over time that very few organizations are talking about these four, yet these four are actually probably the most important. Because this represents a whole person, right? All of those aspects of your life. And so if I take this strategy and I get the right leader, I will win a championship. So the philosophy became, if I develop a champion, and I do that 20 times in a team, those champions will win a championship. That was the philosophy. And so when I put this into practice, I realized, yeah, you can do it. And that it takes time, and you've got to be intentional, and you've got to put the effort in, but you do have to have a plan. And so very simply, right leader, right strategy, right results. So in 2003, does anybody recognize the name Chris Russell? Boys? What team? A little louder. What team is Chris Russell on? Someone said it. Edmonton Oilers, right? In 2003, Chris was 16 years old. He was the only 16-year-old that from WHL teams, they get had one 16-year-old, and it was Chris. And I walked into the Medicinat Tigers, and Chris was sitting there on January 21, 2003. The Medicinat Tigers were in last place. They were six points out of a playoff spot, hadn't been in the playoffs for six years, and they were looking for help. And through a series of events, I got asked into the room, I said, Ernie, could you possibly help our team? And I said, yes, I could. And so this is what I brought in there. I brought... Well, first of all, we've got to have the right values on the team. And then I asked them strategically, you've got to know why you're there, guys. And so I asked the players, what's the purpose of the Medicinat Tigers? And they go, oh, well, maybe have fun, get drafted, learn some skill. I said, no, that's not it. So I broke them into groups of four or five, and I got them to write on a little white card, tell me what the purpose of the Medicinat Tigers is. And so I got in their groups, and I, for 20 minutes, did not hear the right answer. And finally, Steve, Steve Marr said, ah, hey, Ernie, is it to, to win the Memorial Cup? Steve, stand up. Say that a little louder. What's the purpose of the Madison Hat Tigers? To win the Memorial Cup. I say, okay, guys, do you understand that now? So in unison, all 25 players, the purpose of the Madison Hat Tigers is to win the Memorial Cup. January 21st. Our winning percentage at the time was 36. Or last place. In the next 10 weeks, it went to 72. No new players, no new coaches, but an intentional leadership plan. That year, we made the playoffs. We almost took Red Deer out. They were ranked second in Canada. And we lost in game six in overtime. So we almost took them to seven games. In August, I started this. Met with all the rookies. So the rookie camp, the senior camp, and every week for the rest of that year. Where do you think we ended up the next season? We were in last place. We ended up in first. We went to the Memorial Cup that year. We won the championship that year. So within a year and a half of being very intentional, of shaping the right leader, using the right strategy, you'll get the right results. That was 2003. I had the privilege of doing the same thing with the Regina Pats in 2007. They were in last place. It was January. It was Curtis Hunt. And I went to that team, did the exact same thing, and then the next year we were first. And so it is actually possible to be intentional about developing leaders. It takes leaders with the right heart, but it also takes the right strategy. And most people don't want to put the effort in, the time in, or the expense in, but it totally works. When I ran into Justin, 
he looked at this and said, wow, this is amazing. I wish I would have had this when I was younger. And he's a leader that took this and said, Ernie, I want to develop leaders. And he's done it. He's been doing it for the last several years. And you've seen the results. And so if you decide to come to Prairie Hockey, you're going to develop into the right leader and learn a strategy that will not only help you as a hockey player, but it'll help you as a future leader in your home, a future leader in business. And I can tell you right now, Justin's not only successful at developing leaders, but he's successful as a leader in his business, in the workplace. So I hope that this will inspire you to become a champion because you can. But you have to make a tough decision and a tough decision is to come to Prairie Hockey because I want to become a leader. So it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for your attention. I'm available to ask you if you have questions or you just want to talk later, but uh, I'm excited about what Justin's doing. I'm here to support him and uh, all of you because developing leaders is one of my passions and it's the most important thing that we can do as leaders is develop champions who develop life champions. Thank you very much for your time.